Oh, um, okay, we're recording right now. Um, my name is Taya. Most people know me as Taya, Taya Nathan, and I am one of the um, organizers of the um, program of the event. So we have one more minute. Usually we wait for five more minutes for people to start, um, for people to come in, and they do come in. Once again, I want to go ahead and say thank you to everybody who has come week in, week out to support, to listen, to understand, to learn of us. Um, we're hoping today is a very interactive meeting as always. We have the um, lovely Miss Titi from the Cedulous Women Leaders who's going to tell us who the Cedulous Women Leaders are, what they do, um, what we can do together and what they have to support Black women entrepreneurs in Western um, Canada especially deals in the retail space. So um, it is 7.05 right now. I'm going to go ahead and keep quiet and I'm going to give it to you to tell us who you are, what you do, what you can do for us, what we can do together and questions, questions, questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taya, um, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Titi Lola. I'm the program manager at Sedulous Women Leaders. Um, we are a business training and coaching organization. We support um, women entrepreneurs in Canada who are looking to get their product into big box stores. Um, we take them through a series of um, masterclasses to prepare them towards uh, that goal. And at the end of the masterclass, we introduce them to um, category managers or um, buyers and buyers from big box stores. So in that, that's it in a nutshell. If you have more questions about what I do, um, I'll be happy to take your questions at the end of um, today's session. So um, I'm not sure how many of you are in the retail space here. Um, so it'll be, it'll be nice to just, you know, learn about you in the chat, you know, tell me what, uh, tell me if you have a product or if you're interested in learning um, about the retail space. And if you have any questions, then you're not able to turn in your um, uh, microphone, I'll be happy to read your questions in the chat. Okay, so um, for today, we're talking about thriving in the Canadian retail landscape. I'm very enthusiastic about talking about this because this is what I do basically every day. We have many women go through our program. Um, we're actually um, in the third cohort for uh, the season. Excuse my voice, I'm, <laughs> I'm recovering from the, from the weather. Yeah, so we are actually in the third cohort for the second season of our program right now. And it's been amazing. It, the, 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 the program has been tremendous um, in helping these women grow and scale their businesses through retail. And we're very happy because um, the last cohort, which was the second cohort of the second season, um, went through their uh, presentations with the buyers from the big box stores. And many of them are actually in conversations right now on proceeding, on how to proceed with getting their products on the, on the shelves of big box stores. So we're talking um, Costco, Loblaw, TGX Canada, which is an umbrella company for um, HomeSense, uh, uh, Marshalls and um, Winners. So that's amazing. Um, so the big box stores we bring on board for each cohort really depend on the category of the entrepreneurs that we get in that cohort. So that's basically that. So the big question, if you're in the retail space, is how do I thrive? How do I grow? How do I build my business in the retail industry? And, you know, there is... Um... Okay, I think I see something in the chat. Okay, so it, it's, it's, it's a very interesting question when you're in this space, especially if you're an immigrant who's new in Canada and there is a lack of understanding between, you know, um, where you're coming from and then, you know, here, doing business here in Canada. Um, that's usually the biggest challenge for most of our participants, you know, business owners from a, a different country coming into Canada and learning about, you know, the 
the the the Canadian retail landscape and the the, the how everything is done, the processes, um, the regulations, and things like that. Trust me, always a challenge. I'm a very happy because our program helps to bridge that gap in knowledge and really helps them to know how to move forward. So the key thing here, I'm going to be walking us through a few points that I made. I apologize, I wasn't able to make a presentation um, slide because um, I, I have so much I had to cover with work and I didn't get a chance to, but I made notes. So some of the things I want to cover, <clears throat> I feel like I'm struggling with struggling with my voice. My voice is usually not this tiny. <clears throat> I hope you can hear me though. Are we good? You can hear me? Okay, I can't. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Yeah, Thank you. You're good. You're good. We can hear you. Okay, so my you're good. We can hear you. You're doing okay. Thank you. My points. Um, I made six points here to just really help you to see how you can. Um, how you can think about, you know, you getting to that point where you feel like, okay, I think I can do okay in this, in the retail industry. So the first point is understanding the Canadian retail landscape. Two, identifying growth opportunities and emerging trends. Three, leveraging technology and digital transformation. Four, enhancing customer experiences and engagement. Five, navigating regulatory considerations and six resources and support for success so now to the first point understanding the canadian retail landscape now this is really important because first of all you need to understand the market where you're in the market you're looking to do business in. canada has many characteristics now let's narrow it down to the retail space right in the retail industry, there are many things that you have to consider. What are the characteristics of the Canadian retail market? First of all, you need to understand that the market is very diverse. You know, there is the cultural and the social nuances that you need to navigate. You need to understand the behavior of people and how like their cultural backgrounds and social experiences affect how they interact with products and you know how these things affect shopping behavior and things like that right so if you're really able to think about how the consumer preferences shape the retail industry it will really help you to better understand how your products can come to play in the market now number two let's identify growth opportunities and emerging trends Oh, you know what? I didn't say this part in uh, in the first point, understanding the Canadian retail landscape. I think I just really highlighted on one piece of it. You also need to think about the weather. The weather is <laughs> the weather is an interesting aspect of Canada. The Canadian weather has this interesting behavior that people don't really think about in terms of how people shop. You know, um, things are seasonal. Many things are seasonal. And so are people's behavior, people's shopping behavior. And with the way the, with the way I would say technology is informing people's behavior in terms of how they shop, how they behave, um, in terms of, you know, product interaction, you really, really have to think about this. If you have a product, how would my product fare in um, urban or regional areas? We know that there are villages in Canada what are the shopping behaviors of the people in the villages or the or the rural areas um how about the places where you have like the metropolitan cities and how are, pe are people really going into stores what is the food traffic and what's the online shopping behavior these are things that things that i would think about if i had a product right so understanding the, the canadian retail landscape what is it that the that the stores are needing from you um so the big giant stores, the big book stores, they have all their different requirements, for example. So even though these are the big book stores, they sell the same thing. So anything like in the fast um, moving consumer goods category, um, you can place in a grocery store. Okay, what do I need to know for me to be able to place my products um, in those places, right? That's why our program is there for you. So, I mean, you can maybe on your own, maybe go for a networking session, 
and you can meet someone who actually is a buyer. So you meet a buyer and you have a chat and you think that you're building a connection. But when you're trying to have a meeting with them, that's not the point where they'll be telling you, oh, you need to do this about, um, you need to get a private label or you need to get this certification or you need to get this, um, you need to have like some sort of uh, regulatory certificate for this. That's not, that's not their job. They want to buy your product and your product has to be ready. So what are they needing from you? How much do you understand how the retail industry works to prepare you, you know, for that, for that step if you're looking to expand? So this is my space, right? So getting product into big box stores. So when I'm giving examples and making narratives, it's going to be based on my own, um, my own domain. Um, but if you have specific questions, then you can ask after. Okay, now the second point is identifying growth opportunities and emerging trends. And I think that if you would agree with me, COVID was an eye opener for many entrepreneurs. Many businesses started during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that was because being in that situation really, really pushed us to see what the problems are and how to solve them. And businesses that were created in in the covid during the covid-19 pandemic um were really really created um out of the thought of i want to solve a problem i see a gap and i want to solve a problem i want to bridge that gap so i think that if we continue to see how we can um how we can create how we can identify opportunities for growth in that way, if we look at it as, this is not just something that can make me money, this is something that can actually solve a problem. You know, you're really able to think about these things and you're like, um, I can see that this is, I can identify a pain point for someone. For me, I'm a mom of two boys, right? And one of the things I struggle with is teaching them outside of um, school. So, I have a two-year-old, um, a four-year-old, almost five years old. And I really, really want him to be so handsome because my five, my four-year-old is so smart. Um, he's been reading since he was 14 months, became a better reader at two years old. And since two, he's been doing a lot. Like he reads big words, even at four, everyone is amazed. But you know, my challenge is he doesn't know how to write. Really struggling with him even holding a pen. Now, if I find any resource that can help me to teach him how to do that, I used to be a teacher, by the way, that's how he learned how to read very uh, early on. Um, but now I'm no longer a teacher and I don't have that much time on my hands. And so I find myself like grappling with, you know, um, I like figuring things out, like how am I going to really enforce, you know, things here, like how am I, not enforce, enforce is a strong word. He's a little boy. I'm not trying to force him to learn, but I know he's so smart and I'm not looking, I'm looking for ways to enhance his abilities. I should put it that way. Right. And I, I, I feel like I've hit a roadblock because I'm seeing a lot of nice and fancy things to do, but I don't have that much time or creativity to do those things. But if I see one product that can actually help me solve that problem, you think I won't be like, wow, you're a lifesaver. Thank you, right? I'm still looking for someone that would create something that would really help kids learn how to hold a pen. My son is a lefty, I'm a righty, and I think that's a big challenge too. So um, these are some of the issues that I deal with as a mom. But I'm saying this to say that this is a gr growth opportunity for a business in say the educational space, right? How can I help moms who are struggling, who are busy to make learning and writing more fun and, and you know, interesting for their kids? That would be an amazing solution for me. Um, so now if you're thinking of what you can create to solve a problem, how can you design a product that can help you know, solve a problem? I would say, first of all, when you speak with people, you meet people, I think you should be looking at asking, like, say, for example, as a mom, what, what are the things that you struggle with 
And if there was anything that someone could magically create to solve a problem for you, what would it be? Right? I'll be I'll be having those types of conversations when I meet people. Um, you know, if I wanted to look for something that could solve a problem. Another way is also identifying emerging trends, right? I'm going to really emphasize on identifying emerging trends and also the, the, the con of creating a product or solving a problem based on trends. So it's very good if you feel like you can solve a problem um, based on what's trending and what people are struggling with. But the problem with that also is trends come and go, right? How can I create something that's diverse in the diverse retail space? Like I said, people's behavior changes all the time through the different seasons. Are you going to create a product that when it's winter time, you're not going to be able to sell or people will not be able to use? Um, are you creating a product that's, that can evolve with time? Are you creating a product that is innovative? These are things that I want you to consider thinking about, you know, in thriving in the retail space. So in thinking about what's trending right now, I would also say everything evolves. For example, the way Apple started off is not where they are right now. Every single year, there's a new Apple product that comes out. It's the same phone, just an improvement. And sometimes it's, it's a recycled version. Um, so I would say, if you're creating a product, can you create something that you know, even when the seasons come and go, you can switch up? So if, for example, there is this thing I really like so much. If you're Nigerian here, you know Zobo, hibiscus leaf um, flower. I love to drink it. So imagine I'm having a cold glass of Zobo um, in the summertime, but because you have really, really thought about how someone could experience your product, you are thinking, okay, in the winter time, if someone does not want to drink something cold, how can I still make my product valuable and you know useful in different seasons? How about I make it into a tea bag, drink it hot with some honey during the winter time? That's amazing, right? You've solved, you've solved another problem. That way your product will never go out of season, right? People will be like, okay, I think I want some hibiscus flower tea. Or in the summertime, I want it to refresh myself because it's too hot, you know? So those are things that I would say you should think about. The third point is leveraging technology and digital transformation. Hmm. I would tell you if there is any business that exists in 2023 that is not leveraging on technology, I, I don't know what you're doing, right? Technology has created a space for innovation. It's it is so dynamic and it's something that you can you cannot do without in this fast space. Like the retail industry is moving too fast. You blink today, you have a, if you're thinking of a product right now, I bet you there are a thousand and one people that are thinking about the same idea. Right? So if you snooze, you lose. You blink, somebody else does it. So if you are not leveraging on technology and what how you can effectively use technology to create a product and build and grow your business, then you should you should be taking it back, you should be, you know, taking it back say, and thinking about how you can infuse that into your business. Because I will tell you, it's it's really not what you're selling um, at the end of the day. If you're if you're if you have a product that people cannot see and experience, then what's the point? I can tell you, I, I, <laughs> I did some shopping today and you know how I put the things in my cart? It was through someone's recommendation. This product makes my hair so soft. Um, it makes my hair so soft. Uh, I mean, I have really coarse, like kinky, coily hair and it's, it's really hard to maintain sometimes. So I was looking for something that could really help me solve that problem. And one problem I, I, I struggle with is dryness, right? And 
trust me, I could easily go on Google and find products for dry hair or go on Instagram, but I just found, you know, an influencer who was like, oh, products I use for my hair. This one makes my hair really soft and it makes me, makes it easy for me to work through it. So for, for detangling and things like that, and I was like, there you go. I don't need to stress. Now that's technology I use right there. It, it didn't have to be some crazy way. It wasn't used in a crazy way. It was just a normal social interaction with an app and there you go I saw the product never heard of some of the brands but I read about them and I'm like hmm I think I'm interested um so again this is how technology can in inform or influence people's behavior right so I would say please leverage technology to your advantage um speaking of speaking of which I also wanted to talk about visibility here because I want you to also think about how it's nice to be seen. But at the end of the day, if you have a product, you want to get into the big box. Being seen does not always trans uh, does not always um, translate to sales. You want to be able to sell. And here's the big question about selling, right? Who are you? When I say who are you? is I'm saying, what's your product? Who are your products for? Where can you find the people who will use your product? And if you know where to find them, um, would your product be visible or attractive enough, right? And this is where I would say, you need to know your product pricing and you need to know your positioning. Product pricing and positioning is one interesting topic that we talk about in our program. It's a very interactive class all the time because people are like, mm, I didn't know that. Oh, I thought I knew my pricing. Oh, wow. So <laughs> imagine you have this great product, but you have your product in the wrong shelf. It doesn't matter how much social following you have or how much exposure you have. If people cannot find your product where there is food traffic or where they can go online and see them, then there is no point. If your product does not do what it says it will do, then there is no point. If you, if you, tell, if you tell someone that you, know, you have a luxury brand and you have positioned your, your luxury brand in a dollar store, then your product is in the wrong place. So you need to know where your product is supposed to be and make sure it's in that place where the people that you have created it for will find it. So if say, for example, you create something like this um, Zobo leaves that I talked about earlier, as you use an ex as an example, many people in the African and Caribbean community can identify with that, right? So maybe you want to put it in a place where people will not have to question, oh, I know that stuff, like very, very familiar. It's not a, it's not, it's very familiar. It's not something that they would wonder what's that, right? Um, so it's an African store or a Caribbean grocery store. It's easy to carry those there. It's easy for you to get eyeballs on them. That's a good shelf for you. Not the only shelf, right? But you have to identify where you where you need your product to be so that you can convert you can you can be making those sales um because i mean nobody wants to really create product and be getting likes and follows and not selling right that another thing i wanted to say is it's not just okay to create a good product you have to package your product properly and this is where technology also comes to play when i see something on socials for example I buy with my eyes first before I actually pick it up. No, I can't pick it up through my screen, but yeah. I buy with my eyes first before I actually like take a deeper look. You want to make sure that for visual people like us who pay extra attention to details and, you know, products and things like that, you want to make sure that we are not struggling to understand what you're selling. Is it clear enough, right? Is it simple to read? What does it look, what does it say? How does it look? How does it come across to potential consumers, right? So when I pick it up, say for example, someone is 
selling plantain chips, right? And I pick up the product in the store and I actually see a picture of banana instead of plantains. As a Nigerian woman, I know the difference between plantains and bananas. I'll be turned off if it says plantain chips and I pick it up and I actually see bananas instead of plantains. I give this example because we had someone in our program who actually had plantain chips, but in her packaging, she had bananas. And I had to bring that to her attention. The person who made your design obviously does not know the difference between plantains and bananas. And although you know your product, you know how to make your product, you know um, your ingredients, you have no experience in user experience. Uh, you have no, um, you have no, how do I say it, um, incline in how a user would perceive your product. So. I would be turned off because if the if the packaging has a see-through, I could say, hmm, it looks like plantains, but because there's bananas on the on the outside, I don't know, it could be bananas, right? I don't want to take the risk. It's four dollars. I don't want to risk it. Should I risk it or no? The last thing you want to do as a creator of a product is to make people guess what you're selling. You don't want to be unclear. You want to know exactly, you want people to know exactly what you're selling and what, like, exactly what I said. <laughs> so that was, a, that was an example I wanted to, you know, really talk about. You have to know your product. Um, so having a good product, your friends and family say, oh, that's great but you are in a convenience store where uh, is you're in a convenience store that's located in an Indian community who are not familiar with your product that was created, um, you know, from an inspiration by your Nigerian ancestors, maybe your grandmother, your, your grandparents, and you place it in a place, you put it in a, in a store where people cannot really identify them. So that's, that's something I just wanted to mention. Okay, now number four is enhancing customer experiences and engagement. So <clears throat> for example, you know, just to piggyback from what I said from the third point, leveraging technology and digital transformation, like using social media and things like that, enhancing customer experience is also one way that you can, you can use technology. So I'm just going to buttress my point my technology point with, how am I saying that? Okay, I'm just going to really emphasize on how you can use technology to enhance user experience. That's what I meant to say. So there is someone who, um, who uses like notes to, um, like uses fancy notes to like encourage people to engage with their product. So when you buy a product, like they leave a nice handwritten note. Um, that lets you know that you're cute and they appreciate you for buying their product. And even though they don't want to, when they open the, the, the package, they are forced to take a picture because they just think it's cute. So enhancing customer experience is so good because it really helps people feel like they're part of your story and a part of your part of your product. And that's why I encourage like people to share their story where they can in their product. If it's possible for you to write a few lines. Um, in your packaging, do it. Another thing that can enhance user experience is say, for example, putting a guide in your packaging, maybe you're selling clothing or fabrics and things like that. And you put like um, how to wear something or how to care for it. I think for me, um, I don't have the time or the energy to like really think about something. So when I want to, when I buy like a fabric, for example, like a pillow cover and I see do not, um, do not dry, like do not put in the washer or do not put in the dryer. I'm like, I'm always like, oh, thank God, or air dry or something like that. I feel like it makes me feel like I can use that product and enjoy even more, like have the product can have more longevity just because now I'm going to be taking care of it the proper way. So if you have a proper way someone should use things, maybe like a recipe, um, you know, say, for example, you have like a jollof spice or something, um, you can say how it can be served or 
anything that can make it fun fun for someone to use and someone to feel like they can interact with it without stress that would be great so you should really be thinking about like if my five-year-old if i have a five-year-old who is interacting with this product how would they interact with it would they really enjoy using it um so I mean, like having like a focus group is, is something that's sounding technical, if I put it that way, but it doesn't have to be that formal. It could be your family and friends really giving you critical feedback on how they feel about interacting with your product. Also, um, the fifth point is navigating regulatory con considerations. So in Canada, you're not just doing business. It's not business as usual. There are regulatory um um, there are like things, compliances that you have to make sure that you're, you're taking care of, whether it's consumer protection, whether it's employment regulation, if you have a staff for two, you have to make sure it is your, do you have certifications if you're doing food, the food handling certification, if you live in different provinces, you need to find out what regulations are applicable in those provinces and things like that. So think about those things and um, how you can get them, how can you get them? I mean, um, there are information that's available online. There are also networks of people that you can, you know, you can uh, take advantage of. You can ask people who are already doing this and hopefully they can share with you, oh, this is what I did, this is how I did it. Again, remember, one of the characteristics of the Canadian retail space is the diversity across the different provinces. So do not think that, oh, because you're in Canada, the rules will apply, the same rules in, in Ontario will apply in Alberta. It's not always the case, right? So finally, I wanted to talk about resources and support for success. As entrepreneurs in the Canadian retail landscape, it's important that you take advantage of fundings and government programs and associations and mentorship opportunities um, to foster your growth and success. I cannot emphasize this enough. There is money out there. You just need to know what resources to tap into and how to get them. And trust me, the sky is your limit. Okay, thank you all so much for listening. I hope that um, this wasn't too short. <laughs> I wanted to just make it short and sweet and then open the floor for questions. I, I can take your questions in five minutes. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Titi. That was really informative. Yeah. Um, I think our people have heard a lot, and this is really good. So tell me, you said something, there's money out there. How and what kind of money, and how do I find that money? <laughs> there are many opportunities for grants and funding for small businesses. You need to find out what's in your province, what's available in your province. Um, I know in Ontario, because I, I used to live in Ontario, there were lots of small business grants um, that were coming through an organization. And there are many other business organizations like that. The reason I was able to learn about those uh, grants was because I had someone in my network who actually worked there, right? So that's why you need to, I mean, it's unfortunate that a lot of people like to gatekeep. Um, I'm glad that I, I mean, I have people in my life who will tell me, oh, I have something, I've heard of something. Do you know anyone who is interested, you know, to apply? I do that a lot. When I see something, I'm like, hey, apply. But it's as easy as going on Google and looking for just type small business grants or small business loans, um, or looking for business organizations that you can call up to say, hey, I have a small business um, operating here. Do you know any resources I can um, take advantage of? So it depends on your sector also, right? Um, depending on the type of business, how long you've been in existence, like there are different eligibility criteria for uh, participation. Um, if it could be a loan, it could be a grant, even if it's a grant of 2,500, it's still something. Um, there are te technological um, grants as well. So if it's a grant that you need for, say, um, the technical aspect of your business, I'm sure you'd be eligible to apply for those as well. Um, so yeah, they're out there. There's, you just 
it just really depends on what you know. And if you're actually actively looking for information, um, I've got, I got um, $20,000 for my small business. I do photography, media, and things like that. So I had got 20,000 before um, for my small business. And that was the biggest thing I ever got. It went a long way because it really, really helped me set up. Um, so yes, there is money. <laughs> you just need to look in the right places. Okay, would you recommend, I have a question here. Would you recommend using a focus group to launch new products or uh, are, they, are they more beneficial strategy? Are there more beneficial strategies? Um, yes, I would say there, there are different ways that you can do this, but yes, using a focus group may not. Um, so testing out a new product depends on what the product is. I would say, um, if say you're testing out a new recipe, if it's a food product and you're testing out a new recipe, it's something that you might have to keep trying. Um, okay, food. So yes, yes. I mean, food is usually not something you get once. Um, you may need to test out recipes a few times, but if you think you got it, I think you should be asking people questions like, how did you feel eating it? Did you enjoy it? Was it too crunchy? Was it too hard on your, on your cheeks? Um, how many did you eat before you got tired? This will inform you of how many should be in a package, right? Should I make a case of 36 um, for the big box stores? Say Costco, for example, you have to make a bulk, like bulky amount for you to supply to Costco, for example, right? So would it make sense to do a case of 12, a case of 24, a case of 36? Um, instead of putting 10 in a pack, why not maybe do five and reduce the price because colicoli is something that someone can easily get tired of because of chewing. You don't want to make someone tired of the product after just eating one pack so that, you know, you don't want to prevent, prevent them from going back to it, right? So do you want to make sample sizes? Those are, those are questions that you want to be asking people that you're going to be testing out your product with. So other beneficial strategies, I think you will know if you need to employ other strategies in testing your product. Um, you could maybe, um, if you get into a small store, maybe a local store, a convenience store, an African store, maybe you can ask, can I leave samples on your, on the, uh, with the cashier, um, you know, on the way out? How can you do that? Or maybe you can go to a restaurant and maybe have a deal with them. The way they put like fortune cookies in the bag, maybe that can be like a goodie part of the things that will be in their goodie package, right? And maybe just throw one sample bag in an order for someone to test out. And you know, your all your information, contact details will be in the back, right? Of the package. So hopefully those can be strategies that you can also employ, but there is really no one way. There is no one size fits all. Um, for things like this. So yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Do we have any more questions? Oh, okay. I have one question. Um, yes, yes. Packaging should not be misleading. Um, uh, oh, you need, okay. So if you need to contact me, please um, reach out to uh, to do or the admin or um, whoever is in charge, and they'll be able to reach me. Yes, uh, you, I hope Sandra. you don't mind. Hi, um, no, no, okay. can we, uh, would you give us the proper way to find you and we can put it on the group for, um, yes, um, for I'll text later? You. So, yes, yes text us so I'll that we can you. put Thank it there officially. Um, yes, also, I'm... it looks like if you went through the um presentation pretty quickly and i know that there's a lot that we can um learn from this opportunity so would you be willing to come again <laughs> uh yes for sure um i would like to i would like to come again if you want to learn more about how you can be a part of the program um but i can also leave my organization's um website for you to to um go through and learn about how you can be Details are on the website. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Yes. Now somebody see. says there's a is question. It, is it advisable to package food that is not originally made by me? 
Um, uh, foods like holy holy granite cake are made back in Nigeria. Yeah. So, so um, I would say if you can if you can provide like a regulation because it's food, right? You need to be able to show that um, it was produced under the right um, under the right um, quality control um, parameters, right? If you can show that, that would be great. So if you have a factory that makes it, I know that, I mean, in Nigeria, they make these things, you know, by hand and those quality assurance measures are not exactly in place for that. Um, but if the, if the foods can be tested when they come to Canada and you can provide some sort of certification that they meet those requirements, then I believe that you'll be able to do that. But again, when it comes to regulations, you would have to contact the regulatory body um, to find out more information. But yes, food, foods can be made in another country and packaged here. Um, that I know for sure. Say Gary, for example, of course. Um, so yeah, I know you can do that. You just need to find out what the regulations are around that and how to navigate that. Okay, another question here is, um, oh, please help me attend to the question above. Oh, I think that's the question I just answered. I'm not into tutoring business. I just started. I would love to produce a textbook uh, and workbook. That would be great. So stationaries, yeah. So my organization, definitely you have like opportunity to sell at um, TGX Canada. So um um, home sense winners and um, oh no so that would be winners not home sense and and maybe Walmart right okay yes yeah, staples we do not have staples on our partner list at the moment so yeah so maybe in the future but yes textbook workbook would definitely be Walmart um Walmart, Walmart um, winners. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay, all right. I'm happy to um, jump off if we don't have any questions. Like I said, uh, I coming back. Yeah, well, I have another question. Okay. Um, and my question, I guess, is so um, for those of us does your program offer, um, I guess we have another um, organization that we kind of partner with and they're dealing with people who are into ideation and business strategies and all that. And is it something that you, your organization helps out with? No. Because you have mentioned uh, business coaching. Yeah. Uh, so this so, has strictly to do with retail. Yes. So our program is 100% retail focused. So if you want to... If you want to consult, um, if you want to have like a business coaching or consultation, um, my the founder of uh, Sejilas Ejibola Adetokumbo Taiwo has a consultancy um, service that she can provide you, and you can you know have a one on one with her, and she can guide you through um, you know th that process. So that's a different ballgame altogether. You have to pay for that service. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty cool. Well, this has really been informative. Thank um, you. I wonder if there are any questions. I know the women are a group have such wonderful things, um, like the whole idea of even selling or creating textbooks because mm. we learn differently. You know, that aspect of group memorization that we did going that's back up helped us, helped yeah. a lot of us to be more resilient students. Sure. Right, you know, just memorizing one times one, one, two times two. But now in Canada, they don't memorize anymore, they just learn yeah. through play, and that's yeah. also good. But you cannot downplay the idea of the way, sure. um, you know. So, there are lots of ideas here that, um, people who have not been thinking. I guess one of the key things we wanted to do on this group was if you've not been thinking about it. Um, mm. if you've not had your dream to think that you can sell in a big box store, yeah, you never know. You never, you never know. know. You I, never agree. Know. I agree. You never know. Like, I agree. I agree. Years ago, I used to make um, Zobo. I make really good Zobo, but I just I, I didn't mm -hmm. have the confidence to um, bottle it. 
And then seven years later, somebody's already bought in Zobo mm-hmm. and selling it. And I'm like, wow. And I actually can make Zobo. Like, I can make it really mm-hmm. well. You know, mm-hmm. so I looked at opportunities lost that I could have actually capitalized in. You know, I know it's not too late if I wanted to, but no, the point I'm making late. is, the point I'm making is we can, we can do this. Ladies, if you're interested, um, reach out. Yeah. And then if you can send us, you know, some grants, maybe, if you're living in Ontario, um, if you know of anything, if you can just pass it along, we'll be happy to share with people, like, actually, small business grants, as opposed to say non-profits, right? Mm-hmm. That might be something that, um, if, if I, I can ask that, if I'm able to ask that yes. of you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Somebody says, do you have any partners that are into jewelry? Um, oh, yeah. Custom jewelry, maybe. Um, so TJX Canada, again, um, fashion, fashion outfits, you know, um, accessories, all of that stuff. So yeah, that would be, I mean, TJX Canada from history, they don't really say no. (laughs) They don't really say no to any of our participants because our participants have gone through this program and they are so ready because like, this program really checks you. There are people who have gone through the program and they're like, you know what? I know the direction I want this to go now and I'm not ready to pitch, right? It really, really helps you. It helps you to align yourself and helps you to really evaluate what your own capability is. Um, There is someone who in the first season said no to Costco because they knew Anyway, Costco was not their heart's desire, but they got a yes from Costco, but they didn't go with Costco because they knew that they were not capable to capable of producing for Costco, right? Because Costco, you have to produce in bulk. Um, so yes, TJX Canada definitely always says, um, they're always open, let me not say always say yes, so that you don't hold me accountable to that. Because what the program guarantees you is that you'll meet a buyer but we cannot guarantee that they will say yes to you, right? That is now your own work to do. Um, but I would say yes, regardless of what your business in, in, is in, in any category, as long as you can find your product in a fast-moving consumer um, goods store, definitely you can, um, you can, um, you know, you can be part of the program. Okay. I think our time is um fast spent anyways. We try to come in on time and leave on time. So okay, it's 751. I I don't know if anybody has any more questions. I know I don't have any more questions. Um I wanna say thank you very much for this opportunity for coming to speak with us. I've definitely learned a lot. Um thank you. thanks for having me. And um and yes, we really appreciate the opportunity and we hope to do more work together in the future. Thank um, you. I think this is it, ladies. Anybody have questions, you can hang out and stay till eight or um, if you want to just um, put your questions also in the chat. We'll send out um, Ms. Titi Lola's um, contact soon um, mm-hmm. as soon as we have it so that you can get our contact her directly or uh, yeah, and we go from there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Thank you all no ladies problem. who were seeing ladies and gentlemen. I think I saw a gentleman in the call. Um, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Tayo and, and uh, Tijun for having me. I hope look forward to coming back to chat with you all again. Take care and uh, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.